new tidbits in there. Uh, uh, and for those who don't um, or who know anything, uh, who don't know anything about the C3 Center, hopefully after the session you will know as much as is possible um, about the C3 Center. It's just a selection of stuff that we do today. Um, so we have a lovely panel, and I'm going to get them <coughs> to introduce themselves to you. Um, uh, but maybe just to start off, us off, um, the, the C3 Center for Creative Industries and Creative Communities is of course there to support research or new knowledge creation or knowledge exchange in exactly those areas in creative industries and creative communities. And as we know, Staffordshire University is really strong in working together with the communities and so are we in the C3 Center. Uh, and so we also have this phase where we say, you know, it con its contributions lie specifically in making explicit innovations and new knowledge produced through creative practices and applied at the intersections of university, industry, and society. So that can be policy, but it can be also creative practice, and we will see some examples of that. So there are some research themes also here on the uh, um, on the uh, on the board, but I'm going to hand over to the first panel member, and they're going to introduce themselves. Um, so first, Mark, I'm going to give you the clicker. Oops. Oh, good. Oh, yeah, fabulous. Okay. Um, and to talk a bit about music and sound, uh, our research group in the CT Centre. Can you see my Yeah, sure. <coughs> so yes, uh, do you have my slides on there? Yeah, it should be one more. One more, excellent. So I'm Marcus Tibero, I'm, as Carola says, uh, an associate professor in music and sound, and I've been invited to talk to you today about the research that we do. Um, oh, no, that's backwards. That's backwards. Mm -hmm. Oh, I've got it upside down. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. No, 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 no. Um, so yes, uh, there are lots of us that are involved in music and sound. There are a number of PhD students. We involve our master's students, various members of staff, and so on. But I think that at the core of it really is myself, Marcus Devero, and my colleague, Dave Palin, that tend to organize most of the research that is centered around music and sound. And uh, I guess the most high profile thing that we do in music and sound that you might have seen is our annual Noise Floor Conference, uh, which has just been and gone. We hold that every May. Um, and we try to attract as many leading researchers, academics, practitioners, and so on from around the world as we can. Um, it's been going since 2009. Dave and I have been running it, uh, just the two of us, since 2019. And we've made a few changes to it since then. We've tried to brand it more as a kind of like academic conference with concerts. Uh, we've introduced themes over the last few years. Uh, and our themes have been from 2019 to today, engagement, collaboration, tradition. And this year's theme was representation. Uh, and the idea is that uh, we're not too strict about it, but we invite uh, you know, panels and uh, papers and our keynotes to engage with the theme as much as they can. And it's been really quite successful. And this year's theme representation, I think, worked particularly well. And so what it is, is we organize a series of concerts surrounded by paper sessions and panels and so on. The concerts tend to be fixed media, uh, acousmatic music. Uh, we have a, a diffusion rig, a multi-speaker uh, system. We also do a lot of audio-visual music. My colleague Dave Palin <coughs> is a professor of visual music, an associate professor, I promoted him there, he's an associate professor <laughs> of visual music. So um, we do a lot of that. And my interests are writing music for acoustic instruments, traditional orchestral type acoustic instruments, or guitars, and so on, and mixing that with electronics. And we're very proud that over the last few years we've managed to attract some really very high profile academics from the world of uh, contemporary electronic music. Simon Emerson, John T. Harrison, Sora Wooderman, who's based at Kiel, Lee Landy, who is the um, editor of Organized Sound, one of the leading journals, Monty Atkins, and Eddie Dobson. So we're very proud of that. And, and I should say, you know, for those not in the area of music, informatics, or sonic arts, 
Maybe the names don't mean anything, but you know those are the top UK names in the field. Um, yeah. So, and they come regularly. They do come regularly, and they support us very well, and they keep in touch, which is the thing I really like. You know, that we, we have regular contact with them, even after they've done their bit. And we're tying all this together at the moment. Click. Click. There we go. Um, into a book. So we have a publishing contract with uh, Rutledge. We have uh, put invitations out to everyone who's presented papers or pieces over the last few years. And the title we have is Collaboration, Engagement, and Tradition in Contemporary Electronic Music, Noise Floor Perspectives. Uh, and it really will be a sort of overview of uh, cutting edge research in the world of contemporary music and electronic music over the last few years. And you can see some of the themes over there on the right of the slide. Uh, artificial intelligence, musical instrument interface design, autonomous performance. These are all, these are all you know, current themes and the things that are going to be changing the way we listen to music, changing the way um, we create music over the uh, next few years. Other publications we have uh, include uh, my colleague has a book coming out, uh, Electronic Visual Music, again with Rutledge, and that should be available in September. And that is going to be a very comprehensive overview of the world of visual music, um, the history of visual music, current practice in visual music, performance strategies, compositional methodologies, and so on. So that, that really will be quite a unique text uh, for that particular area. I don't, think, I don't think there are any other books covering that area out at the moment. So that will be out in September. Very pleased about that. Uh, my last publication was a book chapter in a book called Rethinking the Musical Instrument. Um, my chapter I wrote with a colleague called David Cotter, who is a PhD candidate at Cambridge University. And the editor of this book, Mine Doyantin Dak, is on the Faculty of Music at Cambridge. And it's a collection of writings just exploring our relationships with musical instruments from sort of a phenomenological perspective, I guess, you know, where musical instruments as tools, musical instruments as you know, holders of knowledge, uh, the histories of musical instruments, the performance practices, and so on, things that relate to it in that sort of way. And my chapter uh, is exploring the history of the guitar, specifically the classical guitar, how it works with electronics going back to the 60s, to the present day, and it's supported by a practical example, which is a uh, piece I wrote with David Potter. We wrote it back in uh, 2001. We called it Latent. It's for two classical guitars and electronics. We called it latent because we were doing it at the absolute height of the lockdown and we were doing it online and it just didn't work. So we thought we would use the latency built into, you know, we would use these things that were holding us back to our advantage and, and play with them and use that as a kind of a compositional strategy. So the idea behind the piece, apart from any aesthetic concerns, is that uh, the software that I developed in an environment called SuperGlider, which is an open source uh, environment. Um, tracks the pitch of the guitar as you're playing, and you can use the pitch tracking to change the electronics. So all the electronics in the piece are changed um, just by the performance. So there's no foot switches, there's no pedals, there's no you know, gimmicks and gadgets around. It's just it all comes from the sound of the acoustic instrument. Uh, we created a score for it. It's an open form score. You can see a screenshot of the score on the right. <coughs> I wrote most of the little fragments of music you can see there, and then David Cotter arranged it into that um, graphic that you can see there. And the, in the sort of inner circles, there's a low E string on the guitar, which is supposed to change the electronics. And then all the other little fragments is just an open form way of navigating your way around the piece. So you, you respond to the electronics and you play accordingly like that. And we've been very lucky. We managed to present it at the 21st Century Guitar Conference in uh, virtual Portugal. I didn't get to go to Portugal, sadly. I was in my, my back room at the time. 
But I did get to go to Ancona in Italy back in the autumn, and um, we presented there as well. We performed it there in, in Italy on the Asiatic Coast. So that, that was very good. Uh, we do other things as well. That's not it. Um, but that's an overview of most of what we do. We also uh, uh, present our work at conferences. We've been very lucky to present at the International Computer Music Conference, which I think is probably the, the top conference for our area. Dave presented in Ireland uh, last year and Chile virtually. Uh, I presented in South Korea. We both were at Shanghai. We've had uh, Arts Council funding. Each work, the second bullet point there, was exploring the legacy of the potteries industry, and that was a large-scale work where we used narrative voices, we used uh, existing film footage from the uh, from Stoke-on-Trent, from the film archives, and we created it into a large-scale work. Uh, we presented at various other conferences. We also have PhDs working in our area in things like immersive audio, music pedagogy, documentary sound with Agatha as well, and it all feeds into our teaching and our Masters in Modern Composition. Thank you very much. Hi folks, um, my name is Patrick O'Connor and I'm a senior lecturer in philosophy. And my job, I've got two things to do today. I've got to uh, fly the flag for the humanities as a member of uh, C3. And I've uh, got to introduce you to what philosophy does uh, in the university broadly. I hope you like this slide, um, this graphic. I call it um, Humanities Lectures Run Towards the Warm Embrace of AI Technology. <laughs> No, no, so it's, it's a good story, it's a good story. There'll be, there'll be a happy ending, I promise, okay? <laughs> right, so just in the more uh, prosaic stuff in terms of what's going on, um, uh, our so bread and butter stuff that uh, David there, David Webb and I do, is we do two MA, uh, MAs in philosophy. So we do MA in continental philosophy, uh, MA philosophy of nature, information and technology, that's, uh, they're all distance learning. So we've got students from the United States, Britain, Europe, Middle East, Asia, uh, who come study with us. Um, the end of continental philosophy is classic continental philosophy. So that's the one I, and the program of that day was program, of course they did for the other one. End of continental philosophy, that's, if you don't know, it doesn't, don't know why, but it's kind of, all the three H's, Husserl, Hegel, Heidegger, post-structuralist thinkers, Derrida, Foucault, Deleuze, and uh, so And then philosophy of nature, information technology, which uh, I suppose David leads, is uh, philosophy, uh, uh, I suppose post-structural philosophy of science, I guess, David would be. Uh -oh. Um, <laughs> quiet. Okay. These labels, man. These labels. Um, but uh, so, what uh, what we do in that is we look at what philosophy has to say about cutting edge issues around artificial intelligence, uh, around uh, artificial life, and the difference between those two things, around surveillance technologies, uh, with relation to the environment and how it, uh, the environment of humanities emerges together. At, which contemporary continental philosophy. Uh, that's primarily our throughput as well, where we generate philosophers and potential PhD students. So we get a lot of people come off the MAs and uh, come onto our PhD program later. We also run a uh, Life Matters Thought Nature and Technology Research Series, uh, which is online and I advertise it, so you're all welcome to join at any point. We have uh, visiting speakers on philosophy technology and uh, life and nature and all that good stuff. Uh, we also got some research podcasts going on. This is my one, well, they're all my ones actually. Um, Tala as well, that's a research podcast, research podcast where I talk to academics, such as yourselves, who might <laughs> want to come talk to me for about an hour, and please do that and book some studio time. Rock. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and everybody else as well, it's fun. And the other ones are consumers and technology, 
and uh, continental philosophy, and posthumous technology is one of the interesting one. Look at figures like Donna Haraway and Catherine Hales and Suzanne Zuboff, people like that. Um, okay, so in terms of the, the research thing, what we do is, um, well, uh, these are, I guess these are our books. So David's kind of, David's into the kind of the newfangled experimental exciting kind of philosophy. <laughs> I'm into the old stuff. I'm into the, uh, like Derrida and uh, Cormac McCarthy and Heidegger. And David's, in, David's um, a world-renowned expert on Michel Serre, uh, who's a French philosopher, but he's really interesting. I mean, David will tell you more about him, much more than me, but he works at the intersection, intersection of science, uh, philosophy, art, culture. So it's, a, so it's, a, it's one of the great interdisciplinary thinkers, basically. And uh, David's own research, the current research, is about uh, the intersection of the environmental humanities and um, uh, the work of Michel Serre and new materialisms. Do you want to pop in there, David? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. That was a very <laughs> nice. You're very welcome, yeah. <laughs> OK. Um, I'm, uh, yeah, so my specialties are, I've published a couple of books, uh, Dave's published books, translate, uh, translated works. Um, I recently published a book on Carmen McCarthy, The Supernaturalism or Materialism, some kind of intersection of the book. That's where I'm working out, really. And um, on that, my most recent, or my stuff in, in the pipelines is on, uh, I've written on the Belgian film directors, the Dardens, and I'm going to write on Bazin, I think, next. And uh, I did another one as well, which I can't think of it. Oh, yeah, Henri Aguil, who's a, probably, a, he's a sort of an untranslated French film theorist. Um, very interesting. Um, and that's, that's, that's roughly what we do. Uh, I think, just in terms of rounding it off, I told you it'd be a happy story. I think, like, so because technology and AI is self-correcting and it's about efficiency and it's about compliance and all of these things, what it's actually going to do, I think, is delimit the, the scope of jobs, basically. So it's going to, and this is my, my two cents for it, it's only an opinion, that's what you think. What it's going to do is, it's, because it's sort of become self-programming, it's auto-programming, a lot of the jobs in science, technology, and engineering will not actually be there in the future. I don't necessarily think that's a good, good thing, but we need people like philosophers to, and artists and humanity specialists to figure out what's happening with that transition. Uh, and I think that uh, the future of the university is the humanities. So there shall be, the best thing that the university can do is become militant humanists. <coughs> not too militant, but you know what I mean. Like, we need more German romantic poetry, we need more Shakespeare, we need more theatre, we need more people talk about brain plasticity, we need more people talk about artificial life as well, we need people talk about philosophy, and uh, we need it now. And we'll be there in the end. So we're very, very resilient people. And we're, 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 we're keep us implied, folks, keep us implied, <laughs> yeah? Um, and uh, I'm going to leave you to question, right? Uh, from, before I pass to you, uh, for the next one. Um, uh, just think about it. So Sam Altman, he's the, I guess he's the architect of ChatGPT, one of the architects. He's been doing experiments on what he calls global coin, which is, uh, it's kind of like a Bitcoin, but for the globe. And the way that he's going to do that is by doing sort of laser scans of everybody's retinas. Now I want to ask you how you feel about that. Yeah. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. We're going to get a few questions later after we have introduced the, the research groups. Um, uh, oh, who is the next person? It will be here. Yeah, yeah, I'm uh, Neil Brownsword, Professor of Ceramics and leader of uh, Ceramic Cultures, Apprentices and Debates Research Group. It supports a broad range of activities that contribute new knowledge to the cross-disciplinary study of ceramics in its broader context. Um, it predominantly fosters a practice-like approach, nurturing ideas through making and curating performance. 
code direction and sign specific strategies. These aim to uh, seek new insights into the story and contemporary dimensions of ceramics and material and subject. It adopts an expanded discourse and understanding of ceramics which goes beyond um, traditional perceptions that may confine the dis discipline but still emphasizing the need to build on the accomplishments of the past. Um, so clay as a material and products of fire clay are multidisciplinary and multisensory. With an estimated 28,000 year old history, ceramics continues to be an inspired and ubiquitous material that remains significant to art, history, science, archaeology, architecture and industry. And it also touches every aspect of, a day, of our daily lives, from sanitary wear to mobile phone technology. Um, so current research themes constitute a broad overarching focus concerning regional and post-industrial ceramic contexts and intangible cultural heritage, um, digital culture and its relation to ceramic heritage and material culture. And to date, the group has consisted of fluctuating members of staff, mainly from games and visual effects and augmented and virtual reality, together with two PhD students whose research currently explores uh, the intersection of virtual reality and haptic technology to aid the interpretation and interaction with the thorn collection of East Asian ceramics, and the other um, re-evaluating the intangible cultural heritage Discourse of Stoke on Trent Ceramic Industry, 1970 to uh, 2020. Uh, research outputs continue to be disseminated through a range of exhibitions, events, publications, which demonstrate cultural impacts through collaborations with high profile international partners. So uh, the group continues to build on strong foundations of projects which engage cross-cultural exchange and transdisciplinary uh, collaboration between East Asia, Europe and the UK, at world leading cultural institutions including the Victoria and Albert Museum, in the Chiang World Ceramic Centre in, in South Korea. And uh, since its inception in 2008, I've worked closely with the British Ceramics Biennial bringing my international network into its program by initiating projects with high profile practitioners and institutions. For instance, topographies of the obsolete, developed a collaboration with the University of Bergen. Sorry, it keeps jumping around for some reason. Um, with the University of Bergen and introduced a reimagining of site, place, traditional skill through transdisciplinary artistic research involved 97 participants from 13 countries. Place and Practices invited three leading South Korean artists to respond to Stokong Trent's rich ceramic heritage through the lens of their own making traditions. And these exchanges have introduced new in innovations in clay and ceramics through a reimagining of place, site and traditional skill. They've also brought cross-cultural dimension to the city that has enriched Stoke on Trent's region, uh, regeneration agenda, strengthening the city's position as an international centre of excellence for ceramics. Um, the group, again, continues um, with ongoing collaborative research centred upon the Spode site, and it has engaged. Sorry about this. Um, digital strategies that aim to reimagine, remediate, and re provide greater access to aspects of heritage at risk. When the Spode site ceased trading in 2008, over 70,000 production molds from circa 1850 to 2008 remained in 11 of its buildings. And as byproducts of manufacture, the molds are rarely preserved for posterity. And with the regeneration of the buildings on the site, only a small percentage of this material was recommended for retention. So aware of this disposal issue, the project externalising the archive piloted 
the, uh, the use of 3D scanning technology and photogrammetry as a means of preserving the physical characteristics of a selection of mold typologies and shapes. And four of the sites, um, mold stores were also scanned and transformed into a virtual interactive tour which enabled visitors to navigate their way through what was previously inaccessible spaces on the factory site through touchscreen technology and virtual reality. So by drawing greater public awareness to these endangered spaces and objects through an artistic mediation, the project subsequently influenced Stoke on Trent's archaeology services um, to secure more than double the amount of its moulds through its retention policy, so it had a positive impact. And working in partnership with the BCB, um, has been instrumental in my nurturing of, of, of civic responsibility through championing Stoke on Trent's endangered industrial craft practices within, within numerous national and international contexts. So, within this overarching focus, there are also uh, specific research trends that examine the impact of global economics on traditional manufacturing in North Scotland. And whilst global outsourcing as um, an autom automation have facilitated greater productivity, once commonplace skills associated with manufacture remain largely displaced, threatening the continuation of much traditional knowledge. So the group reevaluates and critically interrogates this important legacy to inspire creativity and innovation for future cultural benefit. One of the core questions underpinning the group and the research asks how traditional practices can both be revived and safeguarded through new, new modes of thinking and creativity in a digital age. These questions have been explored through hybrid, practice-led methodologies to illuminate the knowledge embodied within a variety of industrial practices through fieldwork reenactments and directed collaboration. At the forefront of this research is the need to celebrate holders of intangible heritage and an urgency to capture their lived experience as many remain a senior generation of practitioners who have no mechanism in place to pass on their skills. So in response to UNESCO's 2003 convention to safeguard intangible cultural heritage, there are now 177 countries which have adopted the convention but unfortunately the UK is not one of these countries. But this craft knowledge is, in, is as integral to the city and its cultural identity as, as its grandest structures and treasured artifacts which sit in the museums. This is an exhibition from last year called Alchemy and Metamorphosis commissioned by the Pottery's Museum which explored the creative power of empiricism characteristic to the early ceramic industrialization, ceramic uh, manufacturing North Staffordshire. And in collaboration with curators, archaeologists, digital experts, and ex-industry artisans, marginalized industrial histories were reimagined via multimedia response, but renegotiated redundant technologies, connected geographies, and cross-cultural influences. The project engaged 11, 11 cultural and industrial partners and gained impact across numerous levels as regards regeneration, artistic and cura curatorial practice and cultural heritage. <laughs> um, so, in terms of future and current research preoccupations, there's still um, my research is still pretty much entwined with the Spode site and its uh, potential as a drive for cultural regeneration. So Spode is this unique space which is one of the longest standard factories in Britain to ever uh, to have ex existed for over 230 years on its um, original site of production. And since 1987, 
the Museum Trust, the Spo Museum Trust, for being custodians of the factory's historic legacy. And have very recently reinstated this important collection back on this historic site of production. So outside some 18,000 ceramic items that remain of national and international significance, much of its archive, including 25,000 land engraved copper plates and over 70,000 patterns contained in the original pattern books, constitutes a world-class design history archive. And following a £97,000 grant secured by the uh, National Lottery, Lottery Heritage Fund, Spoa Museum is currently finalising a feasibility study with the aim to develop it uh, as a new resource that educates and inspires visitors, learners, artists, designers and future researchers. So working in conjunction with the Spoa Museum Trust has opened up an opportunity to re redefine the idea of what a museum can be, to offer more meaningful experiences beyond constantly object-centered collections, which are more than prevalent in the city. And disseminating the collection through novel uses of technology is something I'm really interested in, which will enable the widest range of people to intellectually access the Spode archives and signpost access to the physical collection hopefully increasing future tourism and um, securing a path to wider public and economic benefit. So Spode for me is, uh, it represents a key asset, um, especially in the context of the City Council's revitalised agenda for Stoke-on-Trent to become an international centre for ceramics, which I'm currently involved with and developing in collaboration with other regional partners. So this drawing together of a world-class, disparate and untapped collection such as Spode could provide an underpinning resource to engage new cross-disciplinary research which can hopefully enrich our understanding of the unique ceramic cultural heritage and rich human narratives of ceramic manufacturing in Stoke contracts from both a regional and global perspective. These are some of the parts I've been working with, so thanks. Thank you. Uh, so I actually represent two groups really today. So one will be film and media and the other will be practice as research, but I will focus on the second one. But there will be some overlap uh, in between these things. So I'm not talking about creative practice research, but one thing I should say, as you've realized from our previous presentations, obviously, uh, what we do in C3 is creative practice, so I'm not trying to claim what my colleagues wonderfully presented uh, as my uh, area here, but I, what I'm trying to do is to focus on different strategies of how we as a center can support new people, PhD students, and anyone willing to go into practice research, and how we can think about uh, perhaps concept, concept, conceptualizing uh, the work which can be done around that. So just to give you a little bit of a background, um, as a centre we're involved in supporting practice research from undergraduate to masters to postgraduate level. So with undergraduate there will be um, STARS, uh, which is an undergraduate research scheme, which I was involved since last year. And uh, we have uh, some C3 members, Carola being one of them, applied and, and uh, being accepted for, for uh, the scheme. So we basically introduce undergraduate students to the idea of research. Uh, then we got a new masters in film uh, starting next year. So one of the setting points for the new master is, is practice as research as well. And uh, I personally uh, try to work on different strategies to attract and support uh, new PhD students working in creative practice. And again, especially from my side, that will be people working in filmmaking practice, and I'll talk about it uh, in one of the next slides. Now, perhaps uh, it's a bit premature, but I thought we would plug in our ideas uh, for the center. So what we're doing with Jack, who's very kindly filming us today, uh, we're working on the new ideas of how we present what we do at C3 in terms of our practices. So uh, we came up with this idea of curations, which resembles if you think about going to a gallery and you have your artworks, you have some text written by the curators, and there might be some um, 
context where you might have a guide explaining how these two work together. So this is how we're trying to curate uh, what we are doing at C3. And this is uh, coming when we're going to have all the leads from different research groups curating their own um, curation, or you might want to compare it to a special issue as well. And again, we're going to bring these three things, three elements together. So there's going to be a selection of actual practice, uh, things we write about, and also perhaps us just talk about uh, what we do, which I think is quite exciting. And this is how we want to uh, just present a uh, kind of really wide, dynamic range of work we do in the centre. Um, I'm kind of reversing the order of what I'm talking about, but I think it's quite important. So. Uh, I'm personally guilty of two sets of publications which I will be uh, hopefully coming very soon. So one of them is a book with Rutledge, which is on uh, filmmaking for, for practice research for filmmakers. And we just recently signed a contract with Intellect, which is on book series. Rob's going to be involved. Uh, and this is going to be a series of eight books uh, about practice research in different disciplines. So the first one is going to be more, again, conceptual of what practice research is in creating disciplines in general and then we're going to move on to different disciplines and quite nicely all the books um, every single one of them will be co-written uh, so co-creation mm -hmm. and uh, some of them will also involve a, a selection of interviews recorded with different uh, creative practitioners which is going to be um, probably available online and they'll be accompanying the book uh, there's a lot of other projects uh, but let me just talk a little bit about our PhD students. So again, I'm just going to give two examples, but of course we have plenty of them. Um, these are uh, two really exciting examples of two PhD students I uh, supervise, uh, who work with creative practice, and, and specifically in film. So we have Francisco Mazza, who uh, actually has a scholarship with us. He's about to finish his PhD, and he's working on a project I designed three years ago, which is called Sonic Landscape of a Documentary Form. Mark is involved in, in the supervision here. And what Francisco is trying to do, he's trying to uh, reverse or kind of uh, I, uh, challenge the idea of primacy of visual in non-fiction film. And he's trying to tell a story, a documentary story, if you like, through sound in, in the first place. And obviously, uh, there are some kind of visuals over there. But he's trying to, to challenge the traditional way of making films. Now we have Awad Ali, I co-supervise with Carola, and he's working on the idea of Kurdish cinema beyond victim. So what Awad is doing, he's involving a lot of uh, uh, data collection practices where he just gathers a lot of stories about history of uh, his nation and the way they're being represented through cinema, through film, and he's going to write a script and actually make a fiction film towards the end. Uh, which is going to try to present the, the idea of a Kurdish nation beyond victimhood. So he's again challenging what's uh, currently happening in uh, Kurdish cinema. Uh, again, this is uh, one of uh, my passions here, so just we're trying to expand the portfolio of uh, um, PhD uh, supervision and expertise. We're trying to work on different strategy on how to increase our PhD recruitment, both nationally and internationally. And we also um, having discussion of perhaps providing more training for PhD supervision for new uh, staff members joining us or willing to supervise uh, practice research. Um, one of many things we do <laughs> are conferences. So I'm just going to briefly talk about this one, but I think the reason uh, it's important that I was kind of not wanting to call it a conference because the idea behind it is to really. Uh, move it or change it into something which is more a, a, an event showcasing practice research. So uh, it's, uh, the original idea was a conference uh, myself and two other colleagues of mine uh, from the department um, set up three years ago. So we created this uh, conference and film festival at the time which was called Communities and Communication. And uh, then we added in a second edition art section to it this year, we won a bid for MEXA conference, postgraduate conference, so again, linking to our postgraduate supervision, and there's a panel on practice research over there. Well, I'm going to I'm gonna use this event, which is happening on July the 6th at the university, and I will rebrand my conference, so communities and communication, which will probably uh, be called something else next year, to make it into purely practice research, extravaganza, as I like to call it. So that's, uh, that's coming. And then uh, another uh, thing which has been incredibly successful is a uh, seminar series, which again I started um, well, almost three years ago, right? well, two and a half years ago right now. And it's a month, monthly uh, online seminar 
uh, where I gathered uh, world experts in practice research and invited them to talk for an hour uh, about different aspects of practice research. So we have things about impact, we have things about how you can um, come up with a research question, how do you uh, find collaborators, how do you uh, secure academic uh, quality, if you like, with your pretty messy creative practice. Uh, and and it's, really, it's been really, really wonderful and uh, uh, has really uh, great reach. I have lots of people uh, from all over the world just emailing me and saying, well, it's really needed, we should do something like this uh, more often. And, and I think it's, it's a very positive thing to happen. And uh, if anyone wants to get involved, all the sessions are recorded and they're available uh, on YouTube channel through our website. So again, all these things we're talking about obviously are available on our C3 website. I should mention that seminar has been called this year with Early Research, and that's how it's going to continue going forward. Um, this is one of the projects as well. I, I should also mention there's a podcast. Again, many of you have been involved in a podcast, so the podcast co is called Taming Your Inner Artist, and that's a podcast, again, I run with um, my colleague from the department. And again, it's more informal than a seminar, but we also talk about different aspects of practice research and research in general. And we talk about uh, how to manage your time, how to manage your collaborations, how to not feel like an imposter if you just do things which don't fit within what the traditional research tells you you should look like, and so on and so forth. Uh, and this is, because I'm probably running out of time, one of the upcoming projects. So this is an article I'm writing at the moment uh, for thinking history, revision uh, past special issue. Uh, but I didn't want to write a normal article, so I, what I proposed is a collaborative experimental provocation, which is kind of called rebellious academia practice research as a form of conceptual art. So what I do with this uh, project, instead of um, following a traditional way of writing about practice, which you normally uh, would see in a way of uh, someone takes a photograph, a piece of art, music, Mark's music for example, and I write a beautiful article about your music. Now why did I reverse it? So I gathered a group of collaborators from different creative disciplines. We have uh, photographers, filmmakers, musicians, dancers, uh, you name them, there's quite a lot, long list. And what I do, I give them a written word, I give them words, and I want them to interpret that in their respective disciplines. So uh, I want someone to dance something for me or perhaps cook a meal based on things. And then uh, we're going to write an article about it. And it's, again, it's about this challenging this idea of uh, primacy of written words. And the reason I'm doing this provocation because I think uh, one of the biggest uh, challenges I uh, talk to or hear from people working with creative practices is this idea, well, you really have to write about everything, and yeah, I love writing, I think it's fantastic, but sometimes what we do as practice is, is uh, seen as just this kind of addition to what we do, and you really shouldn't, you should have that. Um, it's all legitimacy, so I'm just trying to kind of, uh, create this kind of discussion. Uh, so yeah, in, in essence, that's what it is. There's lots of other projects, but again, uh, all of these things are on our website and ongoing, and there's lots of things uh, we want to uh, continue doing in terms of supporting the work of uh, people like yourselves. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So just to wrap up before we open up for questions, um, I mean, ju just to, you can see the, the richness of the different groups, and these were only four groups that we just uh, uh, platformed here. We do have quite a few other groups. Um, there are page leads and arts and creative methods within the criminal justice system. That gives us a link to another research area, another faculty, another school. We've got, of course, Nick with uh, the Connected Communities Framework, uh, Anna Francis Lee's Art and Society. Of course, we've got a whole art and design research group. We just formed uh, a digital and creative group just to focus more on the sort of digital creative intersections. And you heard already here that there's a lot of the digital art uh, um, kind of intersection is already going on quite, quite a lot. David White is, is leading the games computer graphics, and we've lost just two leads of um, two of our groups, architecture and film, um, but uh, so we're looking for new leads in, in that area. And of course, I, I could actually show a lot of uh, images of uh, some of the really impactful stuff that we do. I could also quote how much money we've uh, been making in terms of bidding and process, uh, but just maybe to foreground that a lot of what we do is about practice and the reflection on practice, but also engaging with our surrounding communities, 
but not just here, but also international. So in comes this notion of local uh, as well. So we want to have a real local impact, and how we do that is so unique that it has a global significance. And so for instance, we're also involved in our cultural compact here in Stockholm Trent. Uh, and as you heard, we're also involved in sort of policies that shape the places that we live here. We've already heard, we've got actually quite a lot of podcasts, so I think as a centre, there's a bit of work to do to somewhere list on our web pages all the podcasts that are being created in our community, um, because I think it's quite a few. Um, we love, as we can tell, and I was thinking about um, your, your session, we, we love this sort of, also the, the physical, digital mashups. Uh, I used to teach philosophy of music. I'm not a philosopher, but the reason why I was also interested in that area and teaching that was actually to implement music and what is time, what is time, what is music, what is this entity, this abstract entity, um, and teaching philosophy of music helped me then to, to really go to the digital, how do you design it in a digital world, you have to understand it in the real world, and we've always thought that that's where philosophy is so tethered into how we create the world that we want to create, how we shape the world that we want to create. So I'm really pleased. So we're really good at this intersection. And we've heard that, of course, you know, your team works a lot with technology as well as analog interfaces and also the fabulous example of the, the casts mm -hmm. and how the casts, you didn't even mention 3D printers, but in connection with 3D printers could create a sort of historic uh, resilience that maybe that the physical elements alone seem to not be able to hold. You know? So we're really thinking about these, these uh, crucial things. We're really good in events. Digital events, f uh, physical events, remote events, blended events. Um, we, we have done quite a lot. Um, and we celebrate and advocate for you know, the power of creativity. Loads of books, uh, I'm not going to we've already mentioned some. Uh, maybe just a uh, short, just to say, this is a list of the, the bits, I think, that at the moment in or successful uh, awaiting outcome. Um, and it's sort of indicative of the, some of the top themes that we're looking at. So there is, of course, creative practice in there. There's also critical insights into creative practice. And there is increasingly also, we want to be involved in cultural regeneration. We want to influence cultural policy. Um, so there's a real sort of connectivity uh, between us and what we do and the world outside. Um, it is really the sort of permeable university using arts um, in relation to that. We've mentioned a lot of events already. So at the bottom, there's of course you know, the noise floor, which happens annually, the MEXA. Um, uh, we've going to create an online showcase, which hopefully will be launched uh, by the end of the year. Uh, we have, of course, Agatha's Rebellious Research Seminar Series. And we do one-off events as well, strategic events like uh, recently we, we co-hosted a social entrepreneurs hackathon um, also that included sort of culture-led regeneration. Um, we hosted that at the university. So that's sort of a snapshot, but I did want to just first of all open up for questions. Um, but um, also if they're not questions, I'm going to ask the panel to say what are the big things in your area for the next five years. Um, uh, but I'm just going to see if anybody has specific questions for individuals. I'll, I'll leave you to think. I'm going to ask them, the panel, maybe going around the other way around, what are the, the, the big one or two things, uh, the biggest things um, for the next five years in your area? <clears throat> and case ceramics and Tibet sort of song. Yes. <laughs> it's come back and forward like a bad penny as a concept. Yeah. It's been discussed because uh, there's so many international models which, again, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And with the history and legacy of our ceramic industry here, it's a no brainer to do it. I've been banging a drum since 2007 about it. It's about trying to get some financial backing. Yeah. And people seeing the value um, within this place, which I think is largely forgotten about, marginalized, and uh, incredibly undervalued in terms of uh, knowledge, uh, embodied knowledge, uh, people. And I just think it's, uh, yeah, 
but yeah. that's the lining up now because there's so yeah. many things happening. And of course, can kind of you know, happen. having been at the university now for seven to ten years, something like that, you know, I've mm. seen two or three comprehensive plans of the Keramics Innovation Center, Keramics sure. Center of Excellence. So, so it's been in our consciousness, but it's never. I think what, 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 what's, what's, what's happened in the past has been, I think, overconfident, overcomplicated by thinking about this kind of, um, you know, that it's got to be all these things where it's got to link, uh, link in with the kind of uh, ceramic technology, sciences, and you know, the culture thing ends yeah. up at the bottom of the pile. Mm -hmm. So it's all about creating all these new jobs in ceramic technology and the ceramic valley and silicon stoke. Yeah. When really think at its heart is um, yeah. the knowledge base. Culture and that regeneration is now much more um, uh, in the discourses, so, yeah. so maybe now's the time. So I'm going to yeah. stop you there, and we, we might come back to that because it's really fascinating. Um, going around this way around. Yeah. So at the moment I'm working on a funding bit where I brought together people from different continents. So we have uh, Ghana, we have um, Australia, we have Greece, we have Portugal, and we have United States. And what I'm trying to do is to create this kind of expert hub for people uh, working with practice research and develop a set of workshops which we can uh, basically test in different places and just really kind of find some kind of really useful strategies for how we as a community of people working, examining, peer reviewing, practice research, nice. can have some unified standards so know what to... Because my frustration comes from the idea that there are some amazing projects which are being disadvantaged because they're not understood. And sometimes vice versa, sometimes you have a work which uh, is interesting from an artistic standpoint but doesn't really have this research underpinning and I just want to uh, find a way <laughs> Where with uh, really great uh, collaborators who know what they're doing. Some of them are in the process of building that in their own respective countries and just work together and just see how we can find this kind of common ground. And if that is successful and we as the university are partner in this, then obviously we can become a hub for practice research, we can become more attractive for people yeah. and students wanting to work with, uh, with us to do to, to their PhD with us. And that links to all the other things we're doing, so the yeah. masters, the PhD with children, so that's my five-year plan. Brilliant. And of course, we're already, we're already quite well known for practice as research. We, you know, we've got quite a lot of students. I mean, in the center, associated with the center, according to my dashboards, we've got about 47 PhD students um, that work with, with our staff, um, of which I think 60% now are on our Microsoft Teams area. So if they are still PhDs in, in the not on our Teams area, let me know, we'll add you. But I'm just going to go on the big thing for the next five years. Um, well, I think my short to, well, the short to be term is from KTR Monographs, I guess, I don't think yeah. it's going to be a plan for some funding to for uh, level you is the, is the object of it, yeah, for sort of the environmental and humanities project. Um, my short to medium term is complete the monograph, and then what I'd like to do in the long term, at the end of the five year plan, is I was reading recently, I uh, uh, can't think of the name, but I'll pass it on if anyone's interested, about it, this lady who was, um, she was an expert in crisis management, and um, all different types of crises, fascinating individual. And for example, she was uh, one of the first people who responded to Quinfell and things like that. And her primary lament was that she was talking to bureaucrats, she was talking to scientists, she was talking to stakeholders, firemen, and uh, there was something lacking about the whole situation. And I was like, I don't know what it is. <laughs> it's the philosophy of humanities. So th with that in mind, I thought that it re would be really good to, depending on the funding, the EHRC funding, it would be good to set up at least a tentative research network on coping with catastrophe where nice. we draw together yeah. um, philosophers, uh, therapists, I think artists, uh, photographers, mm -hmm. and anyone who can contribute to that. Uh, yeah, that brilliant. Just yeah. a long term of that. Yeah, really looking forward to hearing how it develops. Mark, next uh, big thing that's. In the world of music, I suppose the next big thing. For everyone, not just music, will be artificial intelligence. I think it's going to absolutely change the way people yeah. engage with music, and I think we have to treat that as an opportunity and as a challenge at the same time. So I think that's big thing number one that we're going to try and stay on the forefront of. And big thing number two, I think, is.
Karen and working on engagement and representation in our subject area. And um, I've been exploring ways in my own grant application of them, which is very much ongoing, very much not ready yet. But it's about um, looking at education and music, trying to find ways to uh, you know, widen participation in music education and um, reach people who can normally reach. So I think those are our two big challenges. Yeah, yeah, absolutely important. I remember several years ago I wrote an article, The Death of the Music Industry, and it was all about music education. How, you know, now that we don't have as much music education anymore in the schools, you know, in 10 years' time, our music industry will not be as good as it is now. That's no, I think, I think there are real challenges there. Yeah, yeah, now fascinating. Um, we've got two minutes, so if anyone has any last questions, we do have a question. <laughs> not Debbie really is actually also one of the co-directors of the centre, I should say. And, and it's a comment about the impact, because I just, you know, I think it's good to be aware of the fact, as we listen to, uh, to all of the talks, that the, the impact of the, the uh, researchers working the C3 Centre is, is phenomenal, I think, and that there was, that in for Rev 2021, there's probably a, I think there's a larger number of impact case studies in, in, in development for it, it's the largest number of kind of any single research centre, and you can tell in the ways that you've been, we've been talking about how, um, how you work right from the, you know, the, uh, 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 music and, 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 and academic kind of attainment of things through to Agatha's international partnerships, through to the great idea about the, the, the crisis centre and things through, through, through to Neil's ceramic centre of excellence. I mean, the, the, the potential for that is just off the scale for, in terms of research impact because it's a, it can be like a, a hub for all sorts of researchers to, to work in that context and develop impact. And th this is one of the reasons, it's partly. Uh, um, uh, I applied to be co-director of the centre partly because it's kind of aligned with my own research interests, but also because I think that the scale of impact that's happening is is so so significant and so exciting and, and also quite challenging a lot of it because some of it doesn't easily fit into you know the the, the, the ref kind of structures be, be, uh, because of the you know the um, the nature of the co-production and, and 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 the practices of research we had quite quite a few challenges around that for ref 2021 but we learnt a lot I think through that process so I'm really keen to support other people um, working in that way and to be able to build on, on what we learn for REF 2021 so 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 thinking ahead I, I think that um, that's one of the the exciting things to think ahead over the next years is how we, we can build on on the really um, significant um, impacts that have that, that kind of already have developed within the centre okay. thank you Right, I'm going to uh, call it to a close. Can I just thank the panel, but also thank the audience for listening to us. Um, uh, I think it's been for us a really good place. Um, we took the example of last year, I think it was Chad who did something similar to present. And I think it's a great opportunity for us just to, to platform some of the research groups that we have, because we are quite large, we are quite diverse with a lot of different ways of approaching, you know, really big questions uh, in our existence. Um, mm -hmm. So there you go. But, you know, now it's time for a coffee, and uh, I hope you have a nice rest of the day. Thank you.